United States Army presents The Big Picture, an official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. Now to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. The meaning of the term, the common defense, has changed a great deal since the time our founding fathers immortalized that phrase in the Constitution of the United States. In those days, the army was the bulwark of the young nation's defense. But in the years and the wars that followed, the mighty sister services of the Navy and the Air Force came into being and developed to equal stature. Today, the three services operate under a unified command, working together as the armed forces of the United States. Together, they share the new weapons brought forth by the era of missiles and nuclear arms and contribute their resources to the military exploration of the new world of outer space. The armed forces form a mighty, flexible shield, which by its very existence deters the sinister designs of the forces of aggression. Your Army, Navy, and Air Force form a valiant team that continues to discharge with glory its great, and proud responsibility, the common defense of the United States. This is a report on the nation's defense effort for the year 1958. It is not only about the armed forces, it is by the armed forces and for the armed forces. It is a report of deeds, not words, of performances, not promises. It is a message for every American men and women in and out of uniform, men in battle gear, and women in white, men in the sky, men on the sea, and under it, missile men, all united in one purpose, to keep a pledge to which a great American dedicated this nation almost a hundred years ago that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Today, the greatest challenge to human freedom, communist aggression, threatens the free world. Our commander-in-chief summed up our answer to this challenge of organized slavery. The people of the United States do not wish to enslave or control any other nation or any other people. They seek only to enjoy with their fellow men peace a peace of honor and justice. They respect the rights of all people to do the same. The United States is strong and will remain strong because that is the only way in today's world that the peace can be protected. But the United States will never use that strength to break the peace. The men of the armed forces launched America into the space age when the Army sent aloft our first satellite, Explorer 1, on January 31, 1958. The Navy shortly afterward launched its Vanguard satellite. Smaller than the others, but constructed with greater precision, it is expected to orbit the Earth for 200 years. In October 1958, the Air Force fired its first probe into outer space with a heavily instrumented rocket named the Pioneer. It was catapulted 71,300 miles. Then in December, a huge Atlas ICBM was thrust into orbit as a satellite. From it came the first human voice ever heard from outer space, that of President Eisenhower. This is the President of the United States speaking. Through the marvels of scientific advance, my voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on Earth and goodwill toward men everywhere. 
Preparations in 1958 resulted in the National Aeronautics and Space Administration launching America's first solar satellite on March 3, 1959, assisted by the Army rocket team, which fired Pioneer 4 with its powerful Juno rocket. Dr. Herbert York directs research and engineering for all services. Here is part of the Army's team under Major General J.B. Medeiros, seeking the answers to tomorrow's military needs. On the team is a man whose name has become a household word, Dr. Werner von Braun. As chairman of the Ballistic Missile Committee, Mr. William M. Holliday is the man who coordinates and accelerates high-priority projects. In the ICBM field, Air Force General Bernard Schriever explains the method used to speed up development of intercontinental missiles. Now, in the normal development, production, and operational cycle, we usually take steps in series. By that, I mean we carry out a study program, and then a development and test program, and then we go into mass production before we finally introduce these weapons into the operational inventory. As a result, there is a long time period between the initiation of the development program until we get a new weapon system into the operational forces. We have attempted in the ballistic missile program to greatly reduce this time period. We have done this by what we call a management philosophy of concurrency. By this I mean that we at the same time are carrying out study, development, test, production, and operational actions. By this management concept of concurrency, we believe we can greatly compress the time from the initiation of our development program until we get our first units into the operational inventory. Not far behind unmanned missiles in the advance into space are manned vehicles, such as the F-104 Starfighter, piloted by Major Howard C. Johnson, who swept upward to a new altitude record of 91,249 feet. Major David Simon, who soared even higher in a balloon over 100,000 feet, taking meteorological observations and collecting data on cosmic rays and other radiation phenomena, because the conquest of space must be preceded by the conquest of knowledge about space. But learning about space may take odd paths, sometimes very earthbound. Here is Airman Donald C. Farrow, who spent seven days simulating space flight on the ground in order to determine the effects of isolation in outer space. The vast areas of the faraway corners of Earth offered still another challenge successfully met. Throughout the world, men of the Army and Navy, as well as the Air Force, were quietly carrying out hazardous missions to add to mankind's knowledge of nature, part of the International Geophysical Year. The Navy's Operation Deep Freeze successfully maintained many scientific bases in Antarctica, including one at the South Pole. If our defense frontiers stretch into outer space, they reach into the caverns of the seas as well. For our Navy, the year was truly one of extraordinary achievement. The fictional submarine Nautilus of Jules Verne's great romantic adventure, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, was eclipsed by its namesake in reality. The first of our nuclear-powered subs made a historic passage across the North Pole by cruising under the Arctic ice. And the U.S. Navy, Sunday, 3 August, 1958, 23.50 Eastern Daylight Saving Time, the North Pole. That was the voice of Commander William Anderson, skipper of the Nautilus. And to prove that this feat was not just a freak of good luck, the atomic submarine Skate 
repeated the journey shortly afterward. It circled the North Pole twice before it went on and surfaced in several ice-free spots. America hailed the polar voyages of the Nautilus and Skate. It paid tribute to men of daring like Commander William Anderson, skipper of the Nautilus. And men of vision like Vice Admiral Hyman Rickover, father of the atomic submarine. In honoring the living, we did not forget those whose deeds and sacrifices had transmitted the heritage of freedom guarded by our fighting men of today. From the shivering continental to endure the rigors of Valley Forge, to the rugged defenders of the free world's frontiers, from the Minutemen at Lexington, to the Missile Man of today. At Arlington Cemetery, the nation paid its most solemn tribute when it enshrined the unknown servicemen of World War II and Korea. The same bugle that sounded a solemn tribute to our war dead sounded the alarm when a crisis at Lebanon in the Middle East called for swift action. The Joint Chiefs of Staff transmitted their instructions for action to a unified command. First, Marines streamed ashore at Lebanon. Then the Air Force airlifted Army paratroopers to the troubled spot. While offshore, the ships and planes of the United States 6th Fleet stood guard. A composite air strike force was immediately flown to nearby Turkey, combat ready for any emergency. All these forces, acting under a single commander, set a classic example of non-interference. They remained neutral and kept outside countries neutral so that the Lebanese could settle their political differences by themselves. This they did. Then American soldiers and Marines quietly withdrew. Only weeks later, American power made another impressive show of global mobility 10,000 miles away. This time in the Straits of Formosa, when communist China dropped another spark into the tinderbox of the Kamoys, held by Free China. Again, the rulers of Red China, the Soviet Union's largest satellite, threatened to seize the island. They gave bloody emphasis to their threat by a savage bombardment that destroyed civilian villages and took many lives. Helpless refugees were evacuated to Formosa as the Reds stepped up their shelling. Another great American fighting machine, the Seventh Fleet, gave safe convoy to nationalist supply ships by steaming to within three miles of Kamoi's shores. The blockade was successfully broken, and the invasion threat temporarily ended. Meanwhile, the United States Army strengthened the defenses of Free China by the addition of Nike Hercules missile batteries on Formosa. In the skies overhead, American-built jet fighters flown by American-trained Chinese pilots riddled enemy MiGs with American Sidewinder missiles, which performed as well in battle as in this demonstration. To Formosa itself, the United States Air Force rushed a composite strike force, airlifting some F-104 Star Fighters from the United States to the Far East to strengthen Pacific defense in that area. To these trouble spots came Secretary of Defense McElroy for a first-hand inspection. He visited the 7th Fleet, keeping a watchful eye on the Formosan situation. Then he flew to the other side of the globe to visit Turkey, the anchor of our NATO flank in the Middle East. He found our Turkish allies busy strengthening the NATO shield against aggression. The American equipment which these fine fighters had mastered was proudly shown to the secretary on Turkey's Independence Day. Concrete proof of mutual assistance between friends.
The crises in the Middle and Far East gave impetus to Secretary McElroy and his Pentagon Advisory Group in their task of reorganizing the Defense Department in order to streamline the chain of command. Formerly, the Secretary and the Joint Chiefs issued orders to commands in the field through the departments of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Today, because of the Department of Defense Reorganization Act of 1958, the Secretary of Defense, through the Joint Chiefs of Staff, issues orders direct to the unified and specified commands. Lebanon and Kamoy also emphasized the wisdom and vital necessity of the military pay-raise bill. In an era of weapons and combat techniques of fantastic complexity, the individual fighting man gains, not loses, in importance. He must have not only fighting heart, but fighting skills. To encourage these expensively trained and experienced men to stay in the service, the military pay raise bill establishes special pay raises for special technical skills. Whatever uniform they wear, the dedicated women in each service also provide specialists in many fields. While we must train our specialists and develop our weapons for meeting every threat, we must also soberly weigh the cost. In the words of our president, we must guard against feverish building of vast armaments to meet glibly predicted, predicted moments of so-called maximum peril. The threat we face is not sporadic or, de or dated. It is continuous. Let us take a look at what a year of modernization has accomplished for our arms. In our army, the already formidable firepower of the infantrymen is being increased as production starts on the new M60 machine gun. And the new M14 rifle, both of which will give him greater rates of fire. The pentomic reorganization of the infantry and airborne divisions into five battle groups has been completed. This new organization has improved the striking power, mobility, and flexibility of these divisions. Our soldiers keep watchful guard on the frontiers of the free world. They know why they are there. I've seen this communist threat get bigger and stronger here in Western Europe year by year. But I believe our global defense has kept them from making a really big move. World War III, I mean. Progress in Army missile power is reflected by the Nike Hercules for air defense. It now guards our key cities and industrial centers. New solid fuel missiles like the Sergeant are rapidly being developed to operational status, capable of an atomic punch. They will be smaller, lighter, and more mobile than their predecessors. The Army Jupiter, shown here firing at Cape Canaveral, is an inter-service missile. It will be manned by Air Force crews when deployed. The Air Force Thor has been deployed in England. British crews are being trained to man these intermediate range ballistic missiles. Operational crews are in training for the Bomark, the Air Force's long range anti aircraft missile for area defense. The new Pacific Missile Range went into operation and saw its first test firings. The first ICBM squadron, manned with Atlas, is now in training at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. 
The Air Force, besides its role in missile development, continues to expand its capabilities in range and striking power. An example is the non-stop flight of a strategic Air Command jet tanker from Tokyo to the Azores without refueling, a distance of over 10,000 miles. The F-104 made its appearance, the world's fastest and highest flying jet fighter. Preparations moved along on the first trial flight of the X-15, the experimental plane that is expected to carry its pilot farther into space than any human has yet flown. Today's Navy emphasizes sea power plus science as it drives ahead on the seas, in the skies above, and the waters beneath. 1958 saw the launching of the world's largest submarine, the atomic-powered Triton. And the fastest, the Skipjack. And 28 more, either building or authorized. Nuclear power is being extended to our surface fleet. The new USS Enterprise is now under construction. First aircraft carrier with nuclear propulsion. In the missile field, design and development are going forward rapidly to mate the solid fuel intermediate range Polaris to the atomic submarine so it can be launched from the depths of the sea. In the past year, component parts were tested. The Marine Corps, constantly improving its assault tactics, has increased its firepower and mobility through new weapons like the Ontos. and by adapting missiles from the other services, such as the Terrier. As mobile troubleshooters, the modern Marine Corps maintains its great traditions. Well, this Marine Battalion is organic to the Sixth Fleet. We're prepared to carry out any mission assigned to us by Sixth Fleet or higher authority. And I mean just that, any mission. Our defense effort extended to many allies in many ways. Almost $2 billion were expended last year in new arms and equipment for 40 allied nations under the Military Assistance Program. About 85% of this sum was spent right here in the United States, and every dollar of American aid has been matched by $5 or more by our overseas partners getting such assistance. In addition, NATO allies, like West Germany, form a self-defense shield with American aid. Our armed forces are not only military allies, they are good neighbors and friends. The faces of little children in many lands tell the tale of our unofficial aid abroad. This includes swift help when disaster strikes both as good neighbors and defenders of freedom our men and women in uniform have met the challenge of a fateful year here is the head of our armed forces defense secretary neil mcelroy you have just looked at a few highlights of what we are doing to provide for the common defense today the common defense of our country means effort on a worldwide scale for our own future is closely tied to the continuing security and independence of other free world nations our security program is based on the maintenance of a vigilant, powerful military establishment and on such relationships as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, and many bilateral agreements. With the assistance of American funds, equipment, and know-how, and with the training and guidance provided by American military personnel, friendly nations have been able to build forces capable of meeting local aggression. I came back from a recent visit to our allies in Asia and Europe more convinced than ever that the funds we are spending on military assistance are essential. In our military program generally, our forces are fully capable of carrying out their assigned missions now and for the foreseeable future. Our research and development programs are being pressed vigorously to ensure that this will continue to be true. I can tell you with confidence that our country not only remains strong, but is increasing its defense capabilities. This strength now as always 
rests not only on weapons, equipment, and military installations. It rests first and foremost on people, the men and women who make up our armed forces. More than ever before, our nation needs people of competence who are trained to handle the complex weapon systems of today. The people who comprise our armed forces are doing their part well. It is on them that we depend for our security and for the maintenance of peace. Yes, and the foundation of our armed forces is youth. The great universities of our country are training the scientists and planners who will be serving in civil life as well as in the armed forces to create a better world. The service academies also are turning out bachelors of science, geared to provide leadership in new dimensions of warfare. The traditional long gray line includes future field commanders who will also be soldier scientists. 2,500 miles away from the oldest service academy is the newest, the Air Force Academy at Colorado Springs, Colorado. These future leaders are being thoroughly equipped to help solve the brand new problems of the space age, besides learning the fundamentals of self-discipline, timing, and teamwork. The academy will graduate its first class in 1959. At Annapolis, Maryland, the Naval Academy combines tradition with the expanding horizons of the future. These midshipmen are being trained both as sailors and seagoing scientists. Like every American, young and old, they have faith. Faith in freedom. Faith in country. And faith in God. The Big Picture is an official report for the Armed Forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.